Want to master grammar so you can speak properly, express yourself better, and understand more? In this video, I'll show you how to master grammar with our lessons and learning program. Let's begin. Number one, listen to the lesson conversations and explanations. In every lesson, you learn a conversation. Then, our teachers break down every word and grammar rule. So you're actually learning grammar rules in the context of conversations, and you can easily see how they're used. Once you're done, review the conversation again and again to remember what you've learned. Number two, read the bonus explanations and tutorials. With the lesson notes, you get extra grammar explanations and examples that are not presented in the lesson. After you're done with the lesson, read the lesson notes for extra review. You can even save them as PDFs so that you can access them anytime. Number three, leave a comment on the lesson. Once you've learned a grammar point, be sure to use it. Leave a comment in the comment section. Write some example sentences for practice. Our teachers will review your comment and give you feedback. Number four, unlock even more grammar lessons. If you want to find all of the grammar lessons available, visit our lesson library. Under category, choose grammar. You'll get all of the pathways and lessons dedicated to helping you learn and master sentence patterns and grammar points. So, if you're ready to finally learn a new language the fast, fun, and easy way, sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Signing up takes less than 30 seconds, and you'll start speaking from your very first lesson. If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share it with anyone who's trying to learn a new language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time. Bye! Hi, welcome to Introduction to Arabic. My name is Alicia, and I'm joined by... Hi everyone, I'm Yafa. In this lesson, you'll learn the basics of Arabic grammar. Word order refers to the order in which words are structured to form a sentence in a given language. Consider the English sentence, I ate an apple. But first, let's remove the article an here for simplicity. So we're just left with, I ate apple. The basic word order for English is subject, verb, object, or SVO for short. If we break down the English sentence, I ate apple, we can see that the subject I is presented first, followed by the verb ate, and then finally, the object apple is positioned last. This is the basic word order for sentences in English. Now, let's compare that same sentence, I ate an apple, in Arabic. Akaltu ana tufaha. If we break down the Arabic sentence, we get the verb akaltu, which means ate, followed by the subject ana, meaning I. And finally, we have the object tufaha, meaning apple. Arabic is actually written in red from right to left. We will cover this aspect more in the next episode on writing. The word order for Arabic then is verb, subject, object, or VSO for short. The same sentence in Arabic then is essentially eight I apple. Verb first, then subject and object last. Okay, let's move on to the next section. English is what is called a subject prominent language. This simply means that the subject is slightly more important than other components in the sentence. It's the key piece of information other components in the sentence relate to. Who is doing the action is slightly more important than what is being done or which object it's been done to in English. Arabic, on the other hand, is defined as a null-subject language. That essentially means that the subject isn't valued as much in Arabic as it is in English. In fact, Arabic speakers would likely omit the subject from a sentence altogether wherever they can. Such as when the subject was about you, the speaker, or if the subject has already been established and you're just continuing the conversation. Let's take a look at this phenomenon on null subject in a bit more detail. More often than not, if you wanted to say, I ate an apple in Arabic, you would not say, Akaltu ana tufaha. Instead, you would more likely say, ate apple in Arabic. Akaltu tufaha. Where you omit the subject, I. 
Most Arabic sentences are constructed and spoken like this in real life. In most situations, such as a one-on-one -on -one conversation, it's clear that the person who's speaking is the subject. In cases where it's obvious who or what the subject is, it's almost guaranteed that the subject will be omitted. And so you're left with On the other hand, when it's unclear who or what the subject is, or if you wanted to place emphasis on the subject, like if you wanted to declare from a group of people that it was you who ate the apple, then you would include the subject. But more often than not, most sentences spoken in daily Arabic conversation can be spoken without including the subject at all, particularly if that subject is you. Knowing this, we can easily express any simple action in Arabic using just the object and the verb. Try to create the sentence, I ate a hot dog, from this set of words. Akaltu hot dog. Okay, got it? So we know the verb order of Arabic is VSO. The verb goes first, so let's put ate here. Next would come the subject. But as we learned earlier, we can afford to ignore the subject since the speaker is the same person taking action. Finally, we can add the object hot dog at the end there. And that's it. Akaltu hot dog. You just learned how to say I ate a hot dog in Arabic. Well done. Akaltu hot dog. You can create any basic sentence like this in Arabic if you simply know the word for the verb and the object in Arabic. Let's wrap up this lesson by recapping what you've learned. In this lesson, you learned that Arabic sentences are formed using a verb, subject, object, or VSO word order. Most sentences spoken in Arabic will not actually contain a subject, especially if that subject is obvious, like when it's you, yourself, the speaker. And lastly, you can create basic sentences in Arabic by putting the verb first and the object last. We've covered only the very basics of Arabic grammar. If you're interested in learning more, check out our Arabic in 3 Minutes video series. In that course, we teach you useful phrases while covering the fundamentals of Arabic grammar, and each lesson is only 3 minutes long. In the next lesson, we'll introduce you to the basics of Arabic writing. See you in the next lesson. Bye! Bye! Want to speak real Arabic from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at ArabicPod101.com. Hi everyone, I'm Perihan, and today we're going to have the top 25 Arabic phrases. So let's begin. Assalamu alaikum. Hello. Assalamu alaikum. Hello. So this is the most basic uh, greeting we have in Arabic. So if you enter anywhere, please say Assalamu alaikum. Sabah al khair. Good morning. Sabah al khair. Good morning. And this is so easy. When you see someone in the morning, just tell them Sabah al khair. It sounds cool. Masa al khair. Good afternoon. Masa al khair. That is good afternoon. Tisbah al khair. Good night. Tisbah al khair. That is good night. When someone goes to bed, you simply tell them Tisbah al khair. Good night. Ma ismuk? What's your name? Assalamu alaikum. Ma ismuk? Hello, what's your name? Ana Perihan. I am Perihan. So in reply, the other person says, Ana, and then their name. Ana means I am, and then they put their name. So, Ma ismuk? What's your name? Ana Perihan. I am Perihan. Tasharrafna. Nice to meet you. Tasharrafna. Nice to meet you. So now you have a whole conversation. Ma ismuk? Ana Perihan. Tasharrafna. What's your name? I am Perihan. Nice to meet you. Kaifa haluka? How are you? Kaifa haluka? How are you? How are you doing? Assalamu alaikum. Kaifa haluk? Hello. How are you doing? Ana bekhair. Shukran. Mada ank? I'm fine. Thanks. And you? And this is the reply to Assalamu alaikum. Kaifa haluk? That is, hello, how are you? And you say, Ana bekhair. Shukran. 
ماي ذانك ايم فاين ثانك يو هاو اباوت يو من فضلك بليز من فضلك ذات مينز بليز سو يو كان ساي اجلس من فضلك which means please sit down شكرا thank you شكرا which means thank you شكرا على الهدية thank you for the present عفوا you're welcome عفوا you're welcome so from the beginning شكرا على الهدية thank you for the present and you reply عفوا you're welcome نعم yes نعم which means yes so for example you can say هل تريد قهوة do you want coffee and you reply with نعم yes and you can also add من فضلك من فضلك please لا no the opposite of it لا لا which means no so one more هل تريد قهوة Do you want coffee? No. لا. And you can say شكراً. Thank you. حسناً. Okay. حسناً. Okay. فلنذهب إلى الحديقة. Let's go to the park. And you say حسناً. حسناً. Okay. عذراً. Excuse me. عذراً. Which means excuse me. So for example, you can say عذراً. علي الذهاب عذرا علي الذهاب which means excuse me I have to go أنا آسف I am sorry أنا آسف which means I'm sorry for example you can say أنا آسف على التأخير I'm sorry I am late كم الساعة what time is it كم الساعة which means what time is it you can ask someone كم الساعة كم الساعة الآن which means what time is it now and you can say it's 1.30 إنها الواحدة والنصف إنها الواحدة والنصف أين المرحاض where is the restroom أين المرحاض where is the restroom so you can say عذرا أين المرحاض excuse me where is the restroom انتظر لحظة wait a moment عذرا انتظر لحظة which means excuse me wait a moment بكم هذا how much is this بكم هذا الفستان how much is this dress الحساب لو سمحت could I get the check please so for example if you're in a restaurant you can do this simple hand sign which is like this and you say الحساب لو سمحت الحساب لو سمحت could I have the check please النجدة help النجدة which means help so for example you can say لقد سرقت حقيبتي my bag was stolen النجدة help أراك لاحقا see you later أراك لاحقا which means see you later so when you say goodbye to your friend you tell him أراك لاحقا and if you're saying goodbye to a group of friends you say أراكم لاحقا أراكم لاحقا مع السلامة goodbye مع السلامة which means goodbye أنا ذاهب إلى المنزل مع السلامة I'm going home goodbye and that's it for today I hope you enjoyed this lesson and please subscribe and comment below about your favorite Arabic phrase goodbye <laughs> oh yeah, yeah yeah oh no 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 <laughs> okay Hi guys, this is Nora from ArabicPod101.com. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I will answer some of your most common Arabic questions. The question for this lesson is, where are the personal pronouns in Arabic? In one of the previous lessons, we've already discussed what the sentence structure is like in modern standard Arabic. In this lesson, we will show you what Arabic personal pronouns look like independently. In English, subject personal pronouns precede verbs, like in this sentence, I ate the cake. In Arabic, it's possible to use the independent personal pronoun, ana, meaning I, before the verb. For example, I ate the cake can be translated as, ana akaltu al-kak. 
However, it's common to omit ana because it's already included as the suffix tu in the verb akaltu. So the sentence could look like this. Akaltu al -kak. For beginners, it might seem like there is no indication as to who the subject is, but in fact, the subject is included inside the verb itself. So the addition of an independent personal pronoun is a bit redundant. Nevertheless, it's important to know them, so let's take a look at independent personal pronouns in modern standard Arabic. Ana, I, Anta, you, Anti, you for feminine, Antuma, you for dual feminine and masculine, Antum, you for plural masculine, Antunna. You for plural feminine. Hua. He. Hia. She. Huma. They for dual feminine and masculine. Hum. They for plural masculine. Hunna. They for plural feminine. These are used when it's necessary to stress who or what the subject is as in the case for compound sentences and long sentences with many subjects and events. There are also a must with nominal descriptive sentences. This is because for adjectives, conjugation affixes can't give complete information about a subject, like whether it's in the first, second, or third person. Let's observe the following sentences. Hum amrikiyun. They are American. We're talking about a group of American males in the third person, so we use the pronoun hum. Another example is Hiya mutaba. She is tired. Here we're talking about a female in the third person, so we use the pronoun hiya. I hope you like our lesson. If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below and I will see you in the next episode. Hi guys, this is Nora from ArabicPod101.com. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll be answering some of your most common Arabic questions. The question for this lesson is, how come Arabic doesn't have verb to be? If I were to introduce myself in Arabic, I would say, Ismi Nura. Ismi Nura. If we translate this literally, it would be something like, Name my Nora. Have you noticed that the verb to be isn't in the sentence? In this lesson, we will see how the Arabic sentence structure allows sentences to form without needing the verb to be. We'll see what a noun plus adjective sentence looks like in Arabic. Let's see how to say your nationality in Arabic first. Ana Amriki. I am American. Ana Ferenci. I am French. Ana Mexiki. I am Mexican. Ana Turki. I am Turkish. Ana Espani. I am Spanish. Ana Kennedy. I am Canadian. For a female, you would add an ia sound to the end of the nationality. So, Amriki would become Amrikiya, and so on. Now let's see some other commonly used sentences that contain the verb to be in English, but not in Arabic. As-sama'u safiya. The sky is clear. Al-jawu barid. The weather is cold. Al-baytu kabir. The house is big. Ana ja'ir. I am hungry. Al-tariqu tawil. The road is long. الأكلو لذيذ The food is delicious. You must be wondering what about the past tense? The auxiliary verb كان and its variations are the closest thing to the past tense verb to be in English. For example, كان الأكلو لذيذا The food was good. Note how the past tense verb to be كان in Arabic comes in the beginning of the sentence, unlike in English. You can learn more about this subject by checking out Lesson 8 of our intermediate series on ArabicPod101.com. If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below and I will see you in the next episode. Salam.
Hi everyone, this is Nora from ArabicPod101.com. Welcome to Ask an Arabic Teacher. The question for this lesson is, how do I sound polite in Arabic? Many languages have honorific speech as a whole different level of speech. Arabic honorifics are much easier than that. Much like English, modern standard Arabic and almost all Arabic dialects have certain words and titles that you can add to sentences to make your speech sound more polite. First, let's start with honorific terms and see what they look like in action. The first one is min fadlik, min fadlik, meaning please. Min fadlik is usually used with requests and orders. Adding min fadlik to any request will make you sound more polite and people will take you more seriously. For instance, al hisab min fadlik. Al hisab min fadlik. The check, please. The next honorific term is law samahat. Law samahat. Literally meaning if you may allow. This one means pardon me or excuse me. It's a little like min fadlik, but is more often used with questions. Adding it to any question you ask will make you sound more polite. For example, law samahat. Ain al madkhal. Law samahat. أين المدخل؟ Excuse me, where is the entrance? The next honorific term is حضرتك حضرتك or in the Egyptian dialect حضرتك is the polite alternative of you. Replace you with حضرتك or حضرتك in a sentence and you will immediately sound more polite. For example, أين أنت؟ is the casual way to say, where are you? In the polite version, this becomes, Aina hadratuk? Aina hadratuk? Which also means, where are you? But more polite. Next, we have, Usted and Usted, which mean, Mr. and Miss. Use Usted for masculine and Usted for feminine before people's names to sound more polite. These are typically used for teachers and to address people in a business setting. For example, Sami, which is a man's name, should become Ustev Sami, meaning Mr. Sami. Hiba, which is a woman's name, should become Ustev Hiba, meaning Miss Hiba. Lastly, we have Tafaddal. Tafaddal is the polite way of saying come over here or come in or go ahead. It's a very useful word and is used in many contexts as you can tell from its many different meanings. You might use it to invite someone in, invite them to start eating and many other things. Keep in mind that it changes slightly according to the gender. For example, the casual singular masculine form of this word is ادخل or تعال. It means go ahead or come in. The polite singular masculine is تفضل. The casual singular feminine is ادخلي or تعالي. And the polite singular feminine is تفضلي. تفضلي. I hope you like our lesson. If you have any more questions about the polite form, please leave a comment below and I will get back to you as soon as I can. And I will see you in the next episode. Salam. Hi everyone, this is Nora from ArabicPod101.com. Welcome to Ask an Arabic Teacher. The question for this lesson is, what do common computer and social media words look like in Arabic? Have you ever seen Facebook in modern standard Arabic? Have you wondered what terms and expressions are used in Arabic computers? Let's take a look at some of the most common ones. First, let's see common words used for computers in general. Ibda. Start. This is the Windows Start menu. Lawhatu tahakkum. Control panel. In case you want to change some settings like language, for instance. Malaf. File. Mujallad. Folder. Mustanad. Document. My documents, for example, is called Al Mustanadet, which is the plural form of Mustanad. 
حفظ save to save a file نسخ copy لصق paste حذف delete which literally means to throw away now let's see some expressions related to the internet تحميل download and the opposite is رفع upload تثبيت install to install an app or a program موقع website it literally means site and it's the short version of the expression موقع إلكتروني literally meaning electronic site صفحة web page literally means page بريد إلكتروني email literally electronic mail you might also see email written in Arabic letters sometimes فتح open to open a tab in a browser غلق close to close a tab in a browser تراجع undo to undo an action virus virus beware of this one now let's see some expressions commonly used on social media حساب account referring to a facebook or instagram account for example افتح حساب open an account which is the expression as a whole تسجيل دخول sign in which is the action of signing in اسم المستخدم username literally meaning username many expressions were literally translated from english as you can see كلمة السر password literally secret word it is secret right مواقع التواصل الاجتماعي social media website Social media alone is التواصل الاجتماعي, which is a very, very hot topic these days. أعجبني Like This is the like button on Modern Standard Arabic Facebook, literally meaning I liked it. تعليق Comment Meaning a comment on a post or a status update on Facebook or in a video on YouTube, for example. تحديث حالة Status update, meaning status update used on Facebook mainly. Now, whenever you see a computer and it's set up in Arabic, you'll be able to recognize the most basic functions. I hope you like our lesson. If you have any questions, please leave a comment below and I will see you in the next episode. Salam. Hi everyone, this is Nora from ArabicPod101.com. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll be answering some of your most common Arabic questions. The question for this lesson is, what are some common expressions used in street signs in the Arab world? How cool is it that instructional signs are almost identical in just about every Arabic-speaking country? No matter what dialect the country speaks, instructional signs are always in modern standard Arabic. Let's take a look at the most common instructional signs. First, we have signs that you'll typically see in a parking lot. Khuruj. Exit, دخول, entrance, garage or موقف, parking. Next we have signs you will typically see on the road. قف, stop, اتجاه إجباري, must turn left or right. إلزم اليمين, keep right. إلزم اليسار. Keep left. الأولوية لك. You have priority. هدئ السرعة. Slow down. انتبه. Watch out or attention. The last two signs, هدئ السرعة and انتبه, are usually seen before sudden bumps, construction work, and dangerous curves. Kilometer. Kilometers. Metr. Meters. These two are the shortened versions of kilometer and met respectively, just like km for kilometer and m for meter 
in English. They're usually shortened to fit on street signs. They're used in many signs like the ones that tell you where you are on the highway. For example, if you're 200 kilometers away from Alexandria on the Cairo to Alexandria highway, somewhere on the way you will see a sign that says Metin kilometer, 200 kilometers. Ton, tons. This one is mainly for truck weight allowances. The number you will see next to ton is the maximum weight allowance on this road in ton. Lastly, we have two of the main reasons why people get tickets on the streets of Egypt. <laughs> no entry, commonly used for one-way streets. <laughs> no parking, commonly found in front of exits, entrances, and around important buildings. Driving in the Middle East might feel intimidating at first, but as long as you follow the rules and stay attentive to your surroundings, you'll be okay. If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below, and I will see you in the next episode. Want to speak real Arabic from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at ArabicPod101.com. Hi everybody, this is Nora from ArabicPod101.com, and welcome to our new series, Ask an Arabic Teacher. In this series, I'm going to be answering some of your most common Arabic questions. The question for this lesson is, which dialect of Arabic should I learn or focus on? The variant of Arabic you should learn depends on your goals and what you want to achieve using your knowledge of Arabic. If you want to learn Arabic to become a professional translator, work in politics, read newspapers, or write reports for work, then you should definitely focus on modern standard Arabic. On the other hand, if you want to be able to communicate with Arabic-speaking people, you have to learn a popular dialect that's widely understood, like Egyptian Arabic or Levantine Arabic. As Nelson Mandela once said, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his language, that goes to his heart. And let's get the facts straight. Nobody speaks modern standard Arabic in their daily conversations, not to one person in the whole entire world. To understand the difference in usage between modern standard Arabic and dialects, you need to know what modern standard Arabic and dialects mean to Arabic-speaking people. Babies learn the dialect of their country or region first to communicate with their parents. Then, when they go to school, they start learning how to read and write modern standard Arabic, because this is what they will use to read textbooks, take exams, read books and newspapers. They will learn it from kindergarten up to the end of high school. But depending on their major, they might take more modern standard Arabic courses throughout their college years. For example, if their major is translation or journalism, they will continue taking classes because that's what the news, the formal and legal papers is written in. Other than that, social media, speaking with professors, coworkers, teachers, friends, and family is all in dialect. That's why the average Arabic speaking person might make a lot of mistakes when trying to use modern standard Arabic. Even Arabic speakers need a lot of proofreading when they're writing a very important document. What about choosing between dialects then? Variants of Arabic dialects sound pretty different from each other. They're almost like a different language. Choosing the dialect to study, of course, has to do with the region of the Arabic-speaking world you're interested in, but you should keep another factor in mind. Some dialects are easier to learn and pronounce depending on your native language. For instance, I noticed that Levantine dialects are easier to learn than Egyptian dialect if your native language is Japanese. That's because of similarities in rhythm and phonemes. So listening to different dialects is a good way to get a feel of how they sound before you make up your mind. Keep in mind though that the most widely understood Arabic dialects are Egyptian Arabic and Levantine Arabic because of how popular their media is in the Arabic speaking countries. I hope you liked our lesson. If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below and I will see you in the next episode. Salam. Hi everybody, this is Nora. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll be answering some of your most common Arabic questions. The question for this lesson is, how different is modern standard Arabic from Arabic dialects? And how different are dialects from each other? Greetings are one of the things we learn first when we learn a new language. But how different are greetings, for example, from modern standard Arabic to other Arabic dialects, and from one Arabic dialect to another. 
Let's see some examples of the difference in some greetings. Hello, how are you? Marhaban, kaifa haluk? Hi, zayak. Marhaba, kifak? Good. Bikhair. Kwais. Munih. Now let's see an example of a sentence like what's your name in modern standard Arabic and in different dialects. What's your name? Masmuk. Ismak e. Shusmak. Here's another example. How old are you? Kam umruk. Andak kam sana. Adesh umrak. To change a noun from indefinite to definite, you add an article that is basically like the in English. There's a difference in the pronunciation in different Arabic dialects. Let's see the word the love as an example. Al hub. Il hub. Il hub. Notice the difference between al and il. These are basic examples of differences between modern standard Arabic and two different Arabic dialects. Did you know that on our website, ArabicPod101.com, you can learn modern standard Arabic, Egyptian Arabic, and Moroccan Arabic? Check out our website for more information. If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below and I will see you in the next episode. Salam! Hi everyone, welcome to Ask a Teacher where I'll be answering some of your most common Arabic questions. The question for this lesson is, where is Arabic and its variety spoken? There are many different definitions of the Middle East. Some say from Morocco to Iran, some exclude Iran and Turkey, some exclude Morocco, and some even exclude North Africa. I guess the borders of the Middle East are vague, and not everyone agrees on them. That's why in our lessons we like to use the term Arabic-speaking countries, or Arab world, instead. That's because we're concerned with Arabic as a language and with its varieties. In this lesson, we'll learn together where exactly these variants of Arabic are spoken. Let's start from left to right, from Africa to Asia. First, we have the Maghreb region, which includes Mauritania, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya. Again, not everyone agrees on the definition of the Maghreb region, so opinions may vary slightly. Arabic spoken in the Arab Maghreb region is characterized by infusing a lot of French vocabulary and grammar with Arabic and Berber languages. Many other languages are spoken as first languages in this region, like Tamazid varieties and French. Next we have Egypt and Sudan, where the dialect widely known as Egyptian Arabic is spoken. It's a dialect of Arabic with a lot of ancient Egyptian, Latin, Turkish, French, and English influence. It's a popular dialect in the Arab world due to the popularity of Egyptian music and shows. Other languages are also spoken in this region like Nubian in northern Sudan and southern Egypt. Arabic variants are also spoken in other African countries like Djibouti, Somalia, Eritrea, Tanzania, Chad, and Comoros. Next, let's move on to Asia. Let's take a look at the Levantine region. This includes Palestine, Israel, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. Keep in mind that not all Levantine dialects are the same though. The Gaza Strip region, for example, has some Egyptian influence. Lebanese Arabic has lots of French loanwords. Syrian Arabic has many Turkish loanwords, and so on. However, for the most part, they're mutually intelligible. Next we have the Gulf region dialects which are spoken in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Oman, Kuwait, UAE, Qatar, and Yemen. The dialects of this region and the Levantine region are considered the closest to modern standard Arabic. There are still quite a few differences though. Dialects vary widely in this region, with lots of sub-dialects depending on the city or the region. I remember listening to a friend from Sana'a talk to his friend on the phone and I understood absolutely nothing from that two-minute conversation. Luckily, my friends from Sana'a talked to me in Egyptian Arabic so that we can understand each other. Lastly, we have Iraq, in the far east end of the Arab world. Here, Iraqi Arabic, commonly known as Baghdad Arabic, is spoken. This dialect has Turkish, Persian, Kurdish, and Aramaic influences. The interesting thing about the Arab world is the diaglossia, meaning that people use different languages depending on the situation. As a result of this diaglossia, the news of most of these countries is in modern standard Arabic. But if you walk in the streets or make friends in any of these countries, 
you won't hear anybody speaking modern standard Arabic. Instead, they use their own dialects. Pretty interesting, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below and I will see you in the next episode. Hi everyone, my name is Nora and this is Ask an Arabic Teacher. The question for this lesson is, what do questions look like in modern standard Arabic? There are two types of questions in English, commonly known as yes or no questions and wh questions. The same applies to Arabic. Let's see what Arabic questions look like. First, let's look at yes or no questions. These are questions that ask whether or not something is true. In modern standard Arabic, we use the question word هل to ask yes or no questions. This structure is very easy. You add the word هل before the sentence that you want to ask about. That's it. For example, أكل رامي الكعك رامي ate the cake. If we want to ask whether Rami ate the cake, what do you think we'll say? You're absolutely right. هل أكل رامي الكعك? Did Rami eat the cake? Pretty simple, right? Especially in comparison with English, where you have a different structure for questions. Now let's see how WH questions look like in modern standard Arabic. First, let's see a list of our question words. Men. Who? Mada? What? Mata? When? Ain? Where? Kaif? How? Now let's see what they look like in a sentence. Let's ask these five questions about this event. Rami ate the cake in the house in the morning with the spoon. Akala Rami al kak fi al bayt. Now let's try to ask all the possible questions about this statement. Man akal al kaak? Who ate the cake? Mada akal rami? What did rami eat? Mata akal rami al kaak? When did rami eat the cake? Aina akal rami al kaak? Where did rami eat the cake? كيف أكل رامي الكعك؟ How did Rami eat the cake? As you can see in modern standard Arabic, question words must come at the beginning of a sentence. Then comes the verb أكل, then comes the subject رامي, unless that's the information in question, as in the question who ate the cake. Finally, we have the object الكعك, again, unless that's the information we're asking about as in the question, what did Rami eat? So the order is verb, subject, object. I hope you like our lesson. If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below and I will see you in the next episode. Hi guys, this is Nora from ArabicPod101.com. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I will answer some of your most common Arabic questions. So I get asked this question a lot because this is one of those things that are specific to Semitic languages. And the question is, how are Arabic words created or formed? Derivation is the core of 99% of Arabic words. All words of Arabic origin come from a three or four letter base words called roots. In this lesson, we will learn how derivation works in Arabic. Arabic is a fusional language, meaning that changes can happen in the body of the word itself to create other words of related meanings. In other words, Letters are inserted not just as prefixes or suffixes to the root, but also in between the root letters to form new words. Let's take a look at one of the most basic verbs in Arabic. The root is katabe. The root just on its own is the singular past tense form of the verb. This is also the form we use to look a word up in a classical Arabic to Arabic dictionary. Let's see how we can form a huge number of words out of this root. Katabe, he wrote, which is the root. Katib, a writer. Kitab, a book. Kitaba, writing. Maktab, a desk. Kutayib, a pamphlet. Maktaba, a library. 
اكتتاب Contribution of funds Now let's see the variations of the verb to cook طبخة He cooked which is the root طبخة A meal مطبخ A kitchen طباخ A chef طبخ Cooking مطبوخ Cooked As you can see, letters are often inserted in between the root letters, not just as prefixes or suffixes, to form new words. This makes it a bit different from English, where we usually add an ing or er to create new words. If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below and I will see you in the next episode. Salam. Hi everybody, this is Nora from ArabicPod101.com and welcome to our new series, Ask an Arabic Teacher. In this series, I'm going to be answering some of your most common Arabic questions. The question for this lesson is, which dialect of Arabic should I learn or focus on? The variant of Arabic you should learn depends on your goals and what you want to achieve using your knowledge of Arabic. If you want to learn Arabic to become a professional translator, work in politics, read newspapers or write reports for work, then you should definitely focus on modern standard Arabic. On the other hand, if you want to be able to communicate with Arabic-speaking people, you have to learn a popular dialect that's widely understood, like Egyptian Arabic or Levantine Arabic. As Nelson Mandela once said, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to him in his language, that goes to his heart. And let's get the facts straight. Nobody speaks modern standard Arabic in their daily conversations, not to one person in the whole entire world. To understand the difference in usage between modern standard Arabic and dialects, you need to know what modern standard Arabic and dialects mean to Arabic-speaking people. Babies learn the dialect of their country or region first to communicate with their parents. Then, when they go to school, they start learning how to read and write modern standard Arabic, because this is what they will use to read textbooks, take exams, read books and newspapers. They will learn it from kindergarten up to the end of high school. But depending on their major, they might take more modern standard Arabic courses throughout their college years. For example, if their major is translation or journalism, they will continue taking classes because that's what the news, the formal and legal papers is written in. Other than that, social media, speaking with professors, co-workers, teachers, friends and family is all in dialect. That's why the average Arabic speaking person might make a lot of mistakes when trying to use modern standard Arabic. Even Arabic speakers need a lot of proofreading when they're writing a very important document. What about choosing between dialects then? Variants of Arabic dialects sound pretty different from each other. They're almost like a different language. Choosing the dialect to study, of course, has to do with the region of the Arabic-speaking world you're interested in. But you should keep another factor in mind. Some dialects are easier to learn and pronounce depending on your native language. For instance, I noticed that Levantine dialects are easier to learn than Egyptian dialect if your native language is Japanese. That's because of similarities in rhythm and phonemes. So listening to different dialects is a good way to get a feel of how they sound before you make up your mind. Keep in mind though that the most widely understood Arabic dialects are Egyptian Arabic and Levantine Arabic because of how popular their media is in the Arabic speaking countries. I hope you liked our lesson. If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below and I will see you in the next episode. Salam. Hi everybody, this is Nora. Welcome to Ask a Teacher where I'll answer some of your most common Arabic questions. The question for this lesson is, is voweling important? And where are the vowels in Arabic? If you look at an unvoweled modern standard Arabic text, it'll seem as if it's mostly consonants. Beginner Arabic learners might wonder how it's possible to have so many consonants in a row. The reason behind this is that most vowels in Arabic are transcribed in voweling signs and not as independent letters. For beginner Arabic learners, voweling signs are necessary in order to read Arabic text correctly. That means that you'll sometimes see words that look the same when they're unvoweled but have a different pronunciation. Let's see some examples for that. قل Say in the imperative form. قل It decreased. أكل Food. أكل He ate. 
ذهب he went ذهب gold you have to consider the vowel signs as an essential part of the main text when you learn new vocabulary it might seem challenging but if you think of them as english vowels just on top of or below the consonants instead of in between them it won't seem as awkward native arabic speakers rarely need voweling though because they can tell from the context which part of speech a word is and also because of their years of experience. You can get to that level too by constant practice and regular vocabulary input. You can learn more about voweling by checking our Arabic Alphabet Made Easy series on arabicpod101.com. If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below and I will see you in the next episode. Salam! Hi guys, this is Nora from ArabicPod101.com. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll be answering some of your most common Arabic questions. The question for this lesson is, how do I write vowel signs or tashkil on a keyboard? This lesson is a quick tutorial on how to add vowel signs to Arabic text. So I'm going to be showing you how I do that on my Windows QWERTY keyboard. If you have a different operating system or layout, the buttons might change a bit but the technique is going to be exactly the same. First, let's check out our three main voweling signs independently. We have Fatha, Dhamma, and Kasra. What you want to do is first write the consonant to which you want to add the voweling sign. Then you're going to add the voweling sign itself. You will notice that the voweling sign is added on top of or below the consonant depending on the voweling sign. For Fatha, you want to press Shift Q. For Dhamma, shift E. And for Kasra, shift A. Let's try and write down the word Kutiba. This word has a Dhamma on the Kaf, a Kasra under the Te, and a Fatha on the Ba. You should press the following buttons in this specific order. Kutiba. Kaf, shift E. Te, shift A. Ba, shift E. Q. Kutiba. Pause the video and try it yourself. Now let's check out some more voweling signs. Tanween is a voweling sign that is added to a word when it's in certain positions in a sentence. It is pronounced an or in or un or tan or tin or tun, depending on the position of the word in the sentence and the last letter of the word. To write a tanween with a fatha pronounced an or tan, you press shift W. To write a tanween with a dhamma pronounced un or tun, you press shift R. To write a tanween with a kasra pronounced in or tin, you press shift S. Note that the tanween only occurs on the last letter of the word. Let's try and write the word marhaban meaning hello. Marhaban. Mim. Shift Q, Ra, Ha, Shift Q, Ba, Alif, Shift W. Marhaban. Next we have the Shadda and the Sukun. These two are easy. Let's talk about the Shadda first. It only occurs with consonants and its role is to double the sound of the consonant it affects. For example, from a D sound to a D sound. To write a Shadda, you want to first write the consonant you want to double. Then you press shift tilde, which is the button right below the escape button on your keyboard. Now, when you double the consonant, you also have to add a voweling sign after the doubled sound sometimes. To do this, right after you write the shadda, you can add the fatha or dhamma or kasra on top of the shadda itself. This creates the sound da or du or di, for instance. Let's practice this by writing the word shadda itself, which just so happens to have a shadda on its second letter. Shadda. Sheen, shift Q. Del, shift tilde. Shift Q. Te marbut. Shadda. Lastly, we have the sukun. This is a voweling sign added to a consonant which doesn't have a vowel attached to it. It's especially used when there is another consonant following this consonant. You write the sukun by pressing shift X. Let's see an example for sukun. The word juhd. 
Look at the romanization of this word. You will notice that there are two consecutive consonants, he and del. To make sure that it's pronounced correctly, we put a sukun sign on the he. So let's write the whole word. Juhd. Jim. Shift E. Ha. Shift X. Dal. Juhd. Note that sukun is sometimes omitted when it isn't necessary. So if you see a letter without any voweling between letters with voweling, it automatically means that it might have a hidden sukun. So that's it for our tutorial. I hope you like our lesson and if you have any questions, please leave a comment below and I will see you in the next episode. Salam. Hi everyone, this is Nora from ArabicPod101.com. Welcome to Ask a Teacher where I'll be answering some of your most common Arabic questions. The question for this lesson is, how come there are numbers in between letters when people write Arabic in Latin letters? There are many ways to transliterate Arabic. You can use IPA, DIN, and many other systems. In this lesson, we're going to discuss a system that has been around for more than a decade now, called the Franco-Arabic. Franco-Arabic is used between friends and on social media. Arabic learners find it weird when they see it for the first time because it substitutes Arabic sounds with numbers. Franco-Arabic uses numbers for sounds that don't exist in English. Sounds that do exist in English, however, are spelled with the same Latin letters. Franco-Arabic is commonly used for most spoken Arabic dialects. Let's look at the sounds that don't exist in English and how they're substituted in Franco-Arabic. Here are the most commonly used ones. Two is used to indicate any glottal stop, which is the uh sound. Three indicates ein, while three with an apostrophe stands for rein. Five or seven with an apostrophe indicate kh, while seven stands for h. The less commonly used ones are the following. Four indicates sheen. Six indicates ta. Eight indicates qaf. Nine indicates sod. And nine with an apostrophe indicates dod. As you can see, the second group has close phonemes in English, respectively S, H, T, Q, S, and D. So these Latin letters are often used instead of these numbers. These numbers were chosen because they look similar to their corresponding letters in Arabic. Look closely. Can you see the resemblance? Now, let's see what some sentences in Egyptian Arabic, for instance, looks like in Franco-Arabic. This way, it won't be a surprise next time your Arabic-speaking friend sends you a text in Franco-Arabic. How are you? How are things? Izayak, amil e. Note the a in amil. What happened? Khair, hasal e. Note the khe in khair and the ha in hasal. Patience is good, which is an Egyptian proverb. Sabr hello. Note the sa in sabr and the ha in hello. Probably I won't show up. Ghaliban mishhagi. Note the gh in ghaliban. Franco Arabic is very convenient when using phones or computers that don't have Arabic installed. And it has been very popular for more than a decade now. But did you know that many people in social media are starting to lean more towards writing dialect Arabic in Arabic letters in hopes to keep the Arabic alphabet alive and thriving. I hope you liked this lesson. If you have any questions, please leave a comment below and I will try to get back to you as soon as I can. And I will see you in the next episode. Salam. Hi everyone, my name is Nora and this is Ask an Arabic Teacher. The question for this lesson is, what are sun and moon letters? You might have noticed that sometimes you see Arabic words with an L at the beginning. This L changes a noun from indefinite to definite, just like the English the. But sometimes even if it says L in the text, it is pronounced a. In this lesson, we'll discuss why this happens. To understand this, we have to differentiate between two types of letters in Arabic, sun letters and moon letters. Words that begin with sun letters make the L before it 
sound like an a. Words that start in a moon letter allow the l to be pronounced fully. First, let's take a look at sun letters. Sun letters are referred to as huruf shamsiya. Huruf shamsiya. Because the letter sheen at the beginning of the word shams, meaning sun, is itself a sun letter. Having a sun letter after the definite l will result in two things. Losing the l sound in the l and doubling the initial sun letter itself. Sun letters are del, del, dod, sod, fe, shin, sin, te, nun, lem, ta, ra, zai, va. Let's try to pronounce a word that starts with an l followed by a sun letter. Ashams, ashams. The sun. A thalith. A thalith. The third. Al lahm. Al lahm. The meat. Notice how the sun letter is doubled and how the L sound is lost. Now let's take a look at moon letters. Moon letters are referred to as huruf qamariya. Huruf qamariya. Because the letter qaf in the beginning of the word qamar, meaning moon, is itself a moon letter. Moon letters allow the L before them to be pronounced fully as L. Here are the moon letters. Qaf, Fa, Ain, Ghain, Ha, Kha, Ha, Jim, Ya, Ba, Kaf, Mim, Hamza, Wow. Let's try to pronounce some words that start with an L followed by a moon letter. الماء الماء the water الكلب الكلب the dog الورد الورد the flowers notice how moon letters allow the l to be pronounced fully i hope this was helpful if you have any questions please leave a comment below and i will see you in the next episode سلام Hi everyone, this is Nora from ArabicPod101.com and welcome to Ask a Teacher where I will answer some of your most common Arabic questions. The question for this lesson is How come Arabic has many forms for the same letter? There are 28 letters in the Arabic alphabet but many learners wonder why letters look different in different parts of the word. It can make the alphabet seem like so much more than 28 letters. That's due to the cursive nature of Arabic text. Arabic is written from right to left in a cursive style. So Arabic letters occur in four different forms. Initial, medial, final, and isolated. Let's see examples of some letters in their four different forms. The letter Jim. Initial, Jamil, beautiful. Medial, Majalla, magazine. Final, Thalj, snow. Isolated, Siraj, lamp. Next we have the letter Ain. Initial, Ilm, science. Medial, Muallim, teacher. Final, mana, forbidding. Isolated, mamnoor, forbidden. Next we have the letter seen. Initial, samak, fish. Medial, masah, wiping. Final, hamasa, he whispered. Isolated, hamas, enthusiasm. Some letters don't change much from one form to the other. Only the connection part is different. Let's check out some examples. The letter T. Initial, Tufah, apple. Medial, Mutah, available. Final, Bait, house. Isolated, Salt, a sound. Next we have the letter Dal. 
initial dub bear medial qadr fate final eid feast isolated wedded flowers did you notice the word hamas in the examples the palestinian organization hamas actually means enthusiasm in arabic I hope you like our lesson. Um, please leave a comment below and I will see you in the next episode. Salam. Hi guys, my name is Nora from ArabicPod101.com. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I will answer some of your most common Arabic questions. The question for this lesson is, are there feminine and masculine inanimate objects in Arabic? Well, I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is that unlike French and Spanish, Arabic doesn't have gender-specific articles. Yay! In Arabic, we use the definite article L for both genders, and there is no indefinite article at all. Double yay? There is more good news. You can tell what gender a noun is from its structure. If you see a ha sound, commonly known as ta marbuta, at the end of a word, then it's definitely feminine and will be conjugated as such. For example, the word shajara, meaning tree. Now for the bad news. There are a lot of nouns that don't end in ta marbuta, but they're still feminine nouns. However, there aren't a lot of them, and once you know that they're feminine nouns, you just have to memorize them the way they are. An example of this is sahara, meaning desert. The final part of the noun a uh, is an indication that the word is most likely a feminine noun. It could also be a masculine noun, like the word me, meaning water, which is masculine, so this rule only works with certain structures. But there isn't always a helpful indication. For instance, the word shams, meaning sun, is a feminine word. Do you see at that marbuta? Nope. You have to consciously remember that it's a feminine noun. The last thing you need to know about Arabic feminine and masculine nouns is that they change the conjugation of any verb or adjective that describes them. For instance, we'll look at a noun adjective verb sentence for a masculine noun and for a feminine noun. The tall boy is singing. The tall girl is singing. The first one is masculine and the second one is feminine. See the slight difference in conjugation? Namely, the ta marbuta in the end of al-tawila and the ta in the beginning of tughani. Although this might seem challenging at first, it will feel like second nature with practice. If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below and I will see you in the next episode. Salam. Want to speed up your language learning? Take your very first lesson with us. You'll start speaking in minutes and master real conversations. Sign up for your free lifetime account. Just click the link in the description.